Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the United States Constitution with your host, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Good afternoon. This is Bill O'Brien, and once again, we welcome you to today's version or episode or saga, whatever you'd like to call it, on our Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution. I am Bill O'Brien. We have an absolutely gorgeous day on a Monday, the 22nd of April. It is a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, let me take this opportunity first to apologize for our technical problems last week, but I, I am assured. Uh, uh, I know that uh, Bob spent Bob Kincaid spent the better part of uh, the end of the weekend into the weekend working on some of those technical glitches, and I think we got rid of all the gremlins. And we are very, very optimistic uh, that we are uh, in in delivery mode uh, as we've never been before, and we're ready to go. So I am I am so excited, so pleased, and honored, very honestly honored, to be with you today. Uh, on the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution. And if, if you needed any, any indication or any evidence that a Center for the Study of the Constitution or reflection and careful consideration of the Constitution in our current day and age is called for, then I would suggest to you the events in Boston over the last week would seem to put that, uh, put that uh, idea, that myth to rest. We have uh, today uh, the just got off the got this off the internet uh, 15 minutes ago. Uh, is that the court proceedings on the surviving terrorist in Boston began a began to in his hotel room? And I think uh, that we are um, we are witnessing. Uh, the actions uh, uh, in recent days of the implications and the impact of a constitution that is as is as old as ours and as unchanged as ours, as flexible as ours, uh, and as revered as ours. And so it's it seems to me to speak to the whole idea of the need for more reflection, more study, more discussion, more dialogue about the constitutions and uh, the constitution and its implications uh, uh, for our lives, our day-to-day -day lives in the modern world. Let me begin by giving you a phone number. We would love to hear you. Uh, if you, we would love to hear from you if you uh, are, are so inclined to to give us a call. Uh, and participate in today's discussion. We, I would love to hear from you. I know that uh, some of our presentations to this point have been more informational than anything else, and and I guess uh, uh, I'm I'm using the medium uh, of the internet to deliver information, and 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 I understand that. But at some point in time, it seems to me we need to to kind of try to get our arms around it and understand it and reflect upon it. So as we go, I would love to hear from you and discuss some of these issues and some of these uh, considerations with you. The phone number that we're asking you to call uh, is area code 304-658-3333. That's area code 304-658-3333. If you'd like to email me directly, uh, I will be on my uh, email this evening. I check it several times during the day. so. Your email, believe me, will not set it unread any length, any length of time. My email address: w a o'brien o b r i e n one word nine o six nine zero six at gmail dot com. That's w a o'brien nine o six at gmail dot com. And if I can remember, and, and as I get older, I have a little bit more trouble remembering these things, I will try at least once more, but hopefully more than that, today to repeat these, the, the email address and the phone number. Because, uh, you know, by not giving a phone number, it, it sends the message that this is a one-way monologue, and I don't want it 
I don't intend it to be that. I don't want it to stay that way. And I look forward to your response, your ideas, your, your comments, your suggestions, and, and indeed, things that you can add to the discussion. I think all of us who take the time to tune in on issues this serious uh, deserve to be heard and deserve and their ideas and opinions deserve to be considered and that's really all I'm asking you to do is to consider these things and reflect upon these things as well for yourself I hope I am able to contribute to your understanding of this uh, of the of this whole issue if you recall last week and I, I'm going to go back to the beginning of last Tuesday's program because we were on the air for a brief period, uh, 10 or 15 minutes perhaps, and I really, I really can't remember exactly where we were when we lost contact and we ran into serious technical, technical difficulties, and uh, were unable to finish our program on Tuesday or to even bring you a program on, on Wednesday. But if you remember, a week ago today, last Monday, uh, we were, we were of course still trying to deal with the bombings at the Boston Marathon which which happened less than you know uh, it, less than an hour before we went on the air just an hour before we went on the air an hour and ten minutes uh, at, at uh, 250 on Monday afternoon uh, I along with many of you I I basically uh, uh, took a moment uh, at th at 250 this afternoon Eastern time to uh, to go silent and to reflect upon the events and the, the not only the, those who died, the victims, but also those that were severely injured and those responders who were who were so incredibly efficient uh, and, and, and humanitarian. And I guess that's the, if there's one thing that comes out of this is very positive, it's the fact that one, that people's consideration for their fellow man, in spite of all we hear, uh, is not in trouble. At least what we saw in Boston uh, last Monday indicated that to be to be true. Last Monday we were talking about the sociological theory of one Ferdinand Tunnies, T O N N I E S, with the umlaut over the O, so it's not Tunnies, it's Tunnies, uh, you know, technically speaking in German. Uh, and his book his 19th, late 19th century book entitled Community and Society, Gemeinschaft und Gesellschaft. And we had spent almost the entire program uh, on reflection upon the ideal Gemeinschaft and the ideal Gesellschaft. And at the end of our program on, on that Monday a week ago, we were talking about the, the application of, of theory, the idea of of finding ways to use the theory of Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft as, as a way to create a common language, a common medium by which we can all communicate and understand and reflect and measure and assess and evaluate the nature of, of societies and communities that we look at. What we talked about basically was that if you assume that the ideal community, the ideal Gemeinschaft, is at one end of a political spectrum, and the extreme of Gesellschaft, the ideal, which doesn't exist, a perfect Gesellschaft, exists at the other, then all communities, all gatherings of people throughout history fall somewhere within those two polar opposites. And based on the ingredients, based on the content we do about a particular people, its ideals, its values, its assumptions, uh, its, its practices of worship, of child rearing, of marriage, the relationship between individuals and each other, the relationship between the citizenry and the political leaders. All of these things, once examined, can be used to draw conclusions as, a, as to whether that particular community, that particular society, seems to to lean to, more towards Gemeinschaft or seems to be uh, uh, moving more towards Gesellschaft. And the one point that I had made uh, last Monday, which is the point that Tunnies makes, 
is that as, as you look at the flow of history, there is no question that society as we know it has been and continues to move away from Gemeinschaft and more towards Gesellschaft as we become more and more modern, more and more complex as a society. And again, one of the key characteristics of Gemeinschaft um, is the sense of homogeneity, the sense of unity and togetherness, common values, common language, common history, common heritage, common ethnicity, common language, common race, etc., etc. The more things there are to unify us, the easier Gemeinschaft becomes because there is so much less to divide uh, people into competing interest groups or as James Madison used a James Madison term into competing factions but as we move more towards Gesellschaft we tend to get a greater emphasis on the individual and a reduced emphasis on the community as a whole on the group as a whole and all that that implies suggests the movement towards a much more rational a much more logical a much a, a society which is based more on the priorities and the goals and the ideals and pro, of the individual rather than the group as a whole and one of the things we've talked about uh, in our programs is that when the Constitution was being debated one of the issues that the founders had to deal with was the idea of Republican government the idea of Republicanism and the sense of commitment or what they called civic virtue public virtue that needed to exist in order for a republic to be successful people had to be willing to put aside their own public their own private interests their own self-interest in terms of the public interest and the stronger that commitment to the community was, the closer that particular society or community came to, to Gesellschaft, uh, Gemeinschaft. But on the other hand, the more the individual self-interest tended to prevail over community interest, the more Gesellschaft-like society was becoming. And so while we had, we, we've already seen this uh, in earlier programs and I'm sure we'll return to it over and over again as we go the idealism of the founders in 1776 when the Declaration of Independence was drafted and approved by Congress and celebrated by the public by the by the population of the 13 colonies as as the nation uh, as the perspective the future nation declared its independence the idealism that is evident in the founders in terms of what they believed this nation could become, what they believed republicanism could become in this nation, their faith in people's willingness to put the public interest ahead of their own privacy, their private interest, their, their commitment to the ideal that this was one of the few societies in the world where man had the opportunity to actually create the kind of political structure within which he chose to live tremendously idealistic uh, in many ways some people would argue tremendously naive but there was this tremendous optimism this tremendous sense positive sense of moving towards the ideal uh, the ideal republic as discussed by as defined by Montesquieu in his spirit of the laws the idea well while people are free and people's individual priorities are important when there is the the when threat comes to the entire community people will put aside their own self-interest and spring to the defense of the community the idea being that all of us are so dependent on the rest of us each of us is so dependent on the rest of us that if anything were happened to weaken the bonds which make community community we would all suffer and so challenges or threats to the public interest always necessitate putting aside one's self-interest in defense of the public interest and in 1776 and immediately thereafter especially as the the colonies were successful militarily in winning their independence and securing a very favorable peace treaty in in 1783 um, the optimism grew tremendously 
as the, as the, the former colonies, the now in the 13 independent states, under the umbrella of the Confederation, the, the, the Articles of Confederation, moved into the period where states were free and republics, republican forms of government, were actually in existence. The optimism was incredible. But as we move into the 80s, into the mid-80s, 84, 85, 1786, the optimism begins to fade into, for some, what becomes outright pessimism. And those are the people that seek to change the structure and to revisit the form of government that was created under the Articles and revise the Articles in such a way that some of the vices, I'm using Madison's terms, the vices of the American political system which surfaced during the 1780s could be put to rest with the revision of the political structure in the form of what becomes the Constitution of the United States. So we, we, we've covered this transition, we looked at it. And so there is no question then, as we think back to Madison's Federalist Number 10, and the emphasis on individual freedom, the emphasis on self-interest, the emphasis on the realities which seem the emphasis that Madison put in Federalist Number 10 on individual freedom, the emphasis on the liberty of the individual as being a number one priority, the realization that man was not inclined willingly to put the public interest ahead of his own private interest, the fact that there was so much evidence in the 1780s that private interest was taking precedence over the public interest and many of the other vices that Madison saw in a government which seemed to be incapable of dealing with the realities of the society that was surfacing at the time. There's absolutely no question that you can see example after example in Madison's Federalist Number 10 of the move toward a more gazelle shaft, self-interested, rational, logical, self-interested society and much less interest in the public interest, and to the point that Madison makes the very famous statement that factions are sown into the nature of man. There's nothing we can do to overcome man's inclination as a free human being to unite with or to organize around or with people who, are, who seek the same objectives, the same goals as you do. And these are self-interested goals where people are willing to unite in order to improve their chances of securing their own self-interest, whether in fact it, it supports or whether it contradicts the public interest. And so Madison says in Federalist number, set, in number 10, our challenge, he said, is to create a government, a popular government, which will control the violence of faction. And to Madison, this idea of self-interest being able to prevail over the public interest is a form of violence. Because it is a negative to the, you know, it, it, especially when we're talking about majority factions. It is self-interest for the majority at the expense of the minority or for individuals or for the society as a whole. So Madison's position is this is violence. And so Madison sees the charge address and solve the violence of factions without violating the principles of popular government. In other words, retraining, retaining the elements of a republic but creating a republic in which the public interest will prevail rather than the private interest. This is, in a sense, a Gesellschaft-like situation with the Constitution of the United States. And I think we could debate back and forth the, the, using the terms Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, various aspects of the document, various aspects of the Constitution. I would suggest to you that, that one of the realities 
of the Gemeinschaft Gesellschaft controversy, it seems to me, is addressed in the preamble to the Constitution, which suggests in the preamble that we the people, in order to ensure a more, a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the public defense, promote the general welfare, do hereby create this government. The implication is that the political system being created is intended to preserve a Gemeinschaft-like situation. But in effect, the, way to, the only way to do it is to create a political structure which can contain and control Gesellschaft. The idea being that if Gesellschaft cannot control, then we will return to a much more community-oriented Gemeinschaft-like situation, which to most people is what a republic was about. Anyway, that was the that's the Gemeinschaft Gesellschaft theory that we were that we were talking about a week ago, and a week ago uh, last Tuesday uh, in our second program last week, um, I was in the process of of doing the review that we just that we just did, and I mentioned in the course of discussion where I had first come across the Gemeinschaft Gesellschaft, Ferdinand Tunney's book. And it was in a course that I was involved with in graduate school as a, as a graduate teaching assistant at the University of Wisconsin. And it was a course in history of American education taught by a professor, Jürgen Herbst. Uh, Jürgen, German, J-U-R-G-E-N, Herbst, H-E-R-B-S-T. Uh, as I mentioned, I haven't heard from Professor Herbst for a number of years. Uh, last I heard, he was in assisted living, so I'm, you know, in the Midwest. Uh, I believe uh, in Kansas, Colorado, somewhere. I can't even remember where. But um, I was talking about that's where I was first exposed to this theory of Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, and I have returned to it so many times afterwards. It's become one of the more valuable the more valuable theories that I find so helpful in looking at situations and making judgments or conclusions about particular elements of particular societies, especially as a historian who's been in the classroom for a number of years, I find that the application of this theory very, very helpful. What we would talk, what I was talking about what last week when we had ran into our technical difficulties, was the fact that that the application of theory, while it's very, very valuable and very, very important, is very difficult. It's something that not that many of our teachers had ever have ever had the opportunity to do, except hopefully at the graduate level, because most of our undergraduate instruction has moved much more towards measurable objectives and away from these kind of of situations which require students to apply information and apply knowledge rather than merely master it and regurgitate it. I guess what I'm suggesting, I'm not suggesting it, I'm saying it, is that as I think back to my first exposure to the class that I was first introduced to Ferdinand Tony's in, which is Professor Herb's History of Education class at the university, I am struck by how prescient and how significant and how incredibly powerful this particular class was. I guess what I'm saying is whatever I have been able to do in the classroom since, and I've been teaching college, this is my 48th year of teaching college classes. And one of the things that I need to be sure that I, I, can, I can say without question is that much of what I've been able to accomplish, whatever it is, is directly attributable to my experience in this course and my relationship to Jürgen Herbst. And over this, over this weekend with what's been happening in Boston as a result of the attacks at the Boston Marathon uh, last Monday, we, we have been struck in numerous occasions with the number of people who have been severely injured or indeed taken from us 
uh, the three the three people who lost their lives in the bombing, the pol the young police officer at MIT who was who was murdered uh, on Friday evening, uh, the MTA security official who is struggling for life in a hospital as we as we speak. All of these things, and it's been pointed out to us over the weekend numerous times, speak to the fact that we, we kind of never know that our lives can change in a moment. And people that we assume always will be there forever and ever and ever can suddenly be taken from us. And the point that I was making last week, it's very important. That, and, and one of the things it seems to me we ought to take from this is the idea that when we have an experience, when we interact with somebody that has had the kind of experience on their life that Jurgen Herbst had on mine, then it seems to me incredibly important that we communicate that debt because we might never have the opportunity to do it. While I have, up until about 10 years ago, I maintained not a good, a close relationship with Professor Herbst, but a relationship. And I said many of the things over the years to him that that I I don't really feel that I that I have something that I left something unsaid with him. I think he knows how I feel. But the fact of the matter is, as I do a program like this, it seems to me only just that I basically give credit where credit is due, and much of the credit for everything that I have become professionally and academically is due to Jurgen Herbst and to the kind of class he taught. I have modeled what I do on, on his model. At the time, I found it incredibly difficult to understand. I had never been exposed to it. I had gone through four years of college and graduated from college, but I had never been exposed to the kind of education that I was exposed to in that classroom. And I have tried for the rest of my professional life to, to recreate that experience for other students. I hope I've been somewhat, somewhat successful. A number of years ago, Professor Herbst, and this is the point at which I think I had, I had, we lost our communication last Tuesday, and I haven't had the opportunity since, so I wanted to revisit this. A number of years ago, I was privileged to receive in the mail a copy of a book, President. Uh, uh, Professor Herbst has wrote, written numerous books uh, in education. He was a historian of, 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 edu of Western education and of American education. He was, a he was a, the director of the, uh, the uh, unit, the division or department of educational policy studies at the University of Wisconsin for a number of years. Uh, his whole mission at the university was to essentially uh, introduce educational policies which will produce the kind of educational experience for students that we still find ourselves wanting in, a, in this society in today's day and age. A number of years ago, I opened my mailbox and there was a package. And in it was a book that I knew Professor Herbst was working on. It was his effort to put into print what it was like for him growing up in Nazi Germany during the late 20s and, 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 and 30s and, and early 40s. What it was like to be a child in Germany during the 1930s. The title of his book is Requiem for a German Past. It is an incredible book. It is a, it is a requiem to his life, and I, I think it raises serious questions. Given what, what the nation has been through over the last week with the Boston Marathon situation, it seems to me that a revisit to Jürgen Herbst's perspective is, is important. Because what Professor Herbst raised in the classes, and I sat there during the whole the, the demonstrations about Vietnam and the civil rights movement in America during the late 60s and 70s. I watched him conduct his class in a period of political turmoil in this country. And during the course of that experience, I saw him 
open his soul to students who were conflicted about what to do, whether they should, in essence, put aside what was happening in terms of the Vietnam War or whether, in fact, they should become actively involved in doing what they could do to bring it to an end. Basically, the, the, the issue, the crisis that individual students were feeling at that time was the crisis of whether to stand up and take a position for something they really believed in or whether, in fact, doing that would jeopardize their, their own academic future, their scholarship or fellowship or financial aid or whatever it was, and many of them were torn. And in spite of the fact that we are led to believe today by people who have a vested interest in rewriting the nation's history of the 1960s and 70s, the fact of the matter is all these people were not just lazy hippies who were out having a good time in the streets by protesting the war or protesting the university or anything like that. Most of the students that I experienced, that I encountered during this period were serious, conflicted people who really were looking for guidance in what they should do. And I will never forget the class in which Professor Herbst came in and told 150 students in his classroom that the most important thing that they could do was to put their own self-interest, their academic future, on hold and stand up against what he believed was a tremendously serious mistake that the nation was making in the world. His position is that these students, if they were to be true to themselves and true to their upbringing, would leave the university and go home in order to bring the word as to what was happening on the Madison campus during that period as the campus was under military lockdown in order to keep it open. Students were demanding the university close and classes be suspended and university officials were insisting that the university stay open and that classes go on. And in order to make sure that that happened, armed guards, nas national guardsmen, were being placed in every single classroom in order to ensure that education happened. And of course, the reality is, if you think about the contradiction, it's unclear whether, in fact, real education can actually happen in, a, in an environment where people are being asked to think and discuss and disagree under the barrel of a gun. And so in a sense, the whole mission of education, as most of us see it ideally, was in jeopardy. And that's what Professor Herbst wanted students to return to their home communities and let people know what was happening on that community because there was effectively a news blackout. People were covering the demonstrations and the tear gas and all that, but, but the media was not really getting to the essence of the story he felt. And in the course of that class, he shared with students his experience growing up in Germany in the, during the 1930s and early 40s. And the extent to which he, his brother, and their friends were conscripted into military organizations for youth and how his background as a you know as a as a Prussian his his heritage growing up in Prussia his father his grandparents grew up in Prussia and that militaristic background that he had suggested a degree of commitment to discipline that he found very difficult to break. On the other hand, as he began to realize the horrors that were happening under the name of, of you know, un, under the name of the German nation at that time, created in him and his family a conflict. And he, he shared with us the debate that they had around the kitchen table at night, his mother, his brother, his dad, about his father's concern about whether in fact he ought to commit to join the Nazi party. These were upper middle class professionals 
they were the kind of people that the Nazis hoped to recruit. And the pressure was on his dad to conform. And his dad laid out many of the negatives, according to Professor Herbst. His dad laid out the negatives. What could happen if, if we don't do this? And what kinds of things are happening because too many people submit and allow this to continue? And finally, it got to the point where he lost his dad. And the, the book ends when his mother is in the hospital terminally ill and he as a by this time he's a he's a teenager he gets the opportunity to come to the United States for for a year to study on full scholarship and he's torn because he knows that if he leaves Germany and comes to the United States he'll never see his mother again and her pleading with him to go and her message to him as to where his responsibilities lie is one of the most one of the most moving moving things that I've ever experienced and if I may if you'll bear with me I want to share this because it it continues it continues to move me he says this is at the very end toward the end of the book but my mother had left me a last message in which she quoted from Walter Flex's little book about World War I, and the title is in German, Der Wanderer Swischen Biden Welten, which translated, translated means The Wanderer Between Two Worlds. We're torn this way and we're torn that way. We're torn between Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. We're torn between the ideal and the reality. We're torn between what we hope will be and what reality tells us needs to be. How many of us find ourselves in that kind of predicament over and over again? Herbst goes on. The book itself, Walter Flex's book, is a poetic requiem for the thousands of young Germans who, like the little one at Glinstead, in youthful idealism and love for their country, had given their lives. Near the end of the books, Flex meditates on the meaning of the Requiem. It was these lines that my mother wanted me to take with me as a testament from both her and my father. And this is a quote from Walter Flex's book called The Wanderer Between Two Worlds. Mourning your dead, fellow, is no good service for them. Do you want to turn your dead into ghosts? Or do you want to let them enter your homes? There is no third way for hearts struck down by God. Don't turn us into ghosts. Allow us entrance. We would like to be allowed to step into your circle without disturbing your laughter. Don't turn us into senile, somber shadows. Let us keep the fecund smell of gaiety that lay over our youth bright and sh shimmering. You who live, allow us entrance that we may dwell and stay among you in dark and in joyful hours. Don't cry for us so friends shrink away from talking about us. Help your friends to have courage to talk about us and laugh. Let us enter as we did when we were alive. And basically what Professor Herb's mother is doing is urging him to go and take the best of his youth and the best of his parents with him and share it with those that he will come into contact with for the rest of his life. And he did it. I watched him do it. During the, during the protests during the Vietnam War when the university was shut down, as a teaching assistant, we were taken off salary. Our stipends, which helped us go to college, were denied us because since we were not teaching, we were not paid. And so at the same time that Professor Herbst was encouraging us to follow our heart, to do what our soul told us we needed to do, in the evenings he was calling me to make sure that myself and my roommates that we had enough food to eat 
and that we had the money to pay the rent. One of the most incredible humanitarians I've ever known in my life. And if you don't believe that I cherish this book, and inside the front cover, Professor Hertz, Hertz writes, For Bill, in friendship and appreciation, and all good wishes, Jürgen. Appreciate, he's, he appreciates me? There's no way. I, I just hope that everyone who's listening has at least one person in their life, in, you know, in their life, who holds this kind of a special place. I'm fortunate to have several, and he is one. Uh, just an incredible human being that, that has, has been the spirit for everything that I've tried to do in academics. I mean, he's what led me to, to come up with the idea of the virtual center. He's what led me to pursue studies of the Constitution. He's what led me to pursue graduate studies so that I could teach in the classroom and carry on what I felt was the mission that he had given me. And, you know, I think every one of us have people who have touched us that way. Teachers, first grade teachers, who at the time we may not have appreciated, it's only years later that we begin to appreciate what these people did to help make us who we are. Those things are very important. And if it happens that we come to realize those things while the person responsible is still alive, it seems to me what we've learned this weekend is that it's absolutely important to make those people aware of the impact that they have had on us. Because I think all of us, as we, as we think about leaving this life and hopefully going on to, a, to another life, a better life, would like to believe that we made a difference, that we did something positive for somebody or as many people as possible while we were here. All of us need that. We want it. And Lord knows if we can give that to people, we need to do it. So with that background, with that introduction, I want to return to James Madison again, recognizing that, that I, I believe that I have given due credit here to the person who introduced me to Ferdinand Tunney's and to the theory of Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, which I have revisited so many times in my professional life. I hope that you will, too. If I did justice to it last week, and again, these programs are archived. You can get that over and over again. It was last Monday's program. It was the day, it was the 15th of the month. It was the day our income taxes were due. It was the day that the, bar, the bombs went off at the Boston Marathon. And it was the day that I had the honor of bringing Jürgen Herbst for what to, to life for me, which is the recreation of a theory, a valuable theory that he was, he, he was able to introduce me to. And I hope it has, it's as effective and helpful to you as it's been to me. This is almost going to sound like a, a 180 turn or shifting gears. But I want to go back to James Madison. I want to go back to pure Gesellschaft all over again because um, I just I just so appreciate uh, James Madison and what he was able to do. We looked at it in Federalist Number Ten. Most people will say that if there is one other Federalist paper that is as as significant and as helpful as Federalist Number Ten in understanding the nature of our Constitution and the nature of the way it it structured our political world for us as citizens. The second one was Federalist 51, which Madison penned as well. And I thought, as a, you know, in order to lighten it up a little bit and change gears, something occurred to me as we, as just going back over Federalist number, uh, number 10, but as an intro to Federalist number 51 at all, which is more or less reinforcement. For, for the same thing. Do you remember, I, I'm dating myself here, but do you remember many years ago that there was a song, that, a, a popular song, a hit, that was written by Johnny Mercer? 
and the 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 the, the song went like this. When an irresistible force such as you, I was going to sing this, but I'm not in good voice today. You understand. When an irresistible force such as you meets an old immovable object like me, you can bet just as sure as you live, something's got to give, something's got to give, something's got to give. Think about that. When an irresistible force such as you meets an immovable object like me, you can bet just as sure as you live, something's got to give, something's got to give, something's got to give. I would suggest to you that as we think about Madison's Federalist Number 10, and as we look, as we will for the rest of the program today, at Federalist Number 51, keep Johnny Mercer's lyrics in mind. And think about it this way. When an irresistible force such as you meets an immovable object like me, something's got to give, something's got to give, something's got to give. But what if nothing does? What is the reality, what is the result of two equal forces confronting each other? I would suggest to you that the answer is nothing. If neither force can move the other one, then the status quo remains the status quo. By pitting, as Madison does in the Constitution, as in Federalist Number 10, he's going to explain it in 51, by pitting one element of the political structure of government against another element of government, by creating a system of separation of powers and checks and balances where one branch of government has some influence and control over the other, the sum total of these clashing interests, these, classing, these, cl these clashing f factions, if you will, political factions, is the preservation of the status quo, or to put it another way, way immovable resistance to change. What Madison has done in Federalist Number 10 is so structure the political system that for all practical purposes, it becomes resistant to change. It becomes impossible to move it internally. And so, in a sense, how much change is possible within the system? Remember the old argument between liberals and radicals? Radicals believe that in order to, ch to create change in society, you've got to go outside the system. Liberals believe that the system is susceptible to change. For example, we all know that the Constitution of the United States contains a provision for amendment. We know that the Bill of Rights are the first ten amendments to the Constitution. We know that the Constitution can be amended. It can be changed. But we also know that it is nigh impossible sometimes to create a to get a constitutional amendment through the system. It's not easy to change the Constitution of the United States. Go back to Madison's Vices of the Political System, which he wrote in 1786. Remember Madison said that one of the major problems, one of the vices of government under the Confederation was that state constitutions were constantly being changed and new laws were being passed to replace old ones. And so it became almost impossible for people to even know what the law was on a day-to-day -day basis because it's changed so often. State constitutions were amended hundreds of times. And Madison said not only were there so many changes, but the state constitutions were so susceptible to change, so flexible, so easy to change. All you needed was a majority in the legislature to pass a change, and it became law. And Madison's position was that the sum total of state constitutions which became so confusing because there were so many amendments passed and so flexible 
that they weren't stable. They could be changed so easily. The result was disaster, was political disaster, social disaster, and Madison's concern, financial disaster. Legislatures could pass laws violating the sanctity of private property, violating the sanctity of, of, of economic contract, of business contracts, suspending, we talk, he talked specifically about stay laws and installment laws. Legislatures were at, able to pass laws which would print paper money in bad times, which would, by, de by definition, inflate the value of the dollar. The more money there is in circulation, the more inflation, the more inflated the value is. So by printing more money, you are inflating the value of each dollar. You are effectively making more money available, but you are reducing the value of the money that's available. And so the combination of that, Madison says, that, that there were five different states who printed paper money during the Confederation period in the 1780s. There were any number of states that passed what Madison calls installment laws, where the legislature would pass a law requiring creditors to accept payment for their debts in installments, even if the original contract was for payment in full. In other words, government was infringing or interfering in the sanctity of contract between debtor and creditor. Government, in an, it, it, those, those were installment laws. Stay laws were laws which suspended the payment of private debts for a certain period of time, three months, six months, a year. But not only private debt, stay laws also would apply to the payment of taxes. If citizens were having a tough time getting their hands on coin, on specie, and were unable to pay their taxes, they were susceptible of having their homes taken out from under them, having their homes auctioned off for, for, for bankruptcy. And by passing stay laws, legislatures could suspend people's responsibilities for paying their taxes, which meant that government was denied funds to operate. So the combination of paper money laws, stay laws, and installment laws violated contract and created instability within the country. It created instability in foreign countries for those who would loan American, Americans money, those who would loan state governments or the Continental Cong or the Congress under the Confederation money, Dutch bankers, for example. Who would loan the country money when the government of the country could interfere at a particular time with the obligations for repayment that would do? In other words, it was creating a, an economically unstable situation which was detrimental to the future growth and development of the nation as a whole. Madison believed that these were a couple of the major vices of the state governments under the Articles of Confederation. These were the vices that the Constitution was designed to fix, according to Madison. So if you read the Constitution, states are forbidden to print paper money. States are, prevent, prevent, uh, are prevented to interfere with the sanctity of private contracts. And, and John Marshall, as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in the early 19th century, reinforces the sanctity and stability of contracts in decision after decision after decision uh, in some of the most famous cases. We'll look at some of those. Uh, for example, the Dartmouth College case in 1819, where Madison, where what happens is that Dartmouth College was created during the colonial period by Great Britain. It was a private college. During the Jeffersonian period, in the early 19th century, the state of New Hampshire decides that it wants to make Dartmouth a public college, a state college. And the 
the board of directors, the board of governors of Dartmouth College, goes to the Supreme Court in order to try to block this change from being a private college to becoming a public college. And you may, some of you may remember that the attorney for Dartmouth was Daniel Webster, the famous Daniel Webster. And in his, t in his uh, presentation before the Supreme Court in the Dartmouth College versus Woodward case, Wood Woodward case uh, Daniel Webster makes the point, uh, he ta he's talking about what it means to be a graduate, to be an alumnus of Dartmouth and how it literally is in his soul and his whole being, his whole professional training as an attorney is attributable to what he learned at Dartmouth College. And he talks about how a tear comes to his eye when he thinks about the possibility of people tampering with the sanctity and the, and the, and the existence of Dartmouth as a freestanding private institution that has a contract to exist as such by the King of England. The case goes to, as, as we know, this is an argument that Webster makes before Chief Justice John Marshall in the Supreme Court. And John Marshall finds for Dartmouth College and basically rules, the Supreme Court rules, that the, the contract clause of the Constitution makes that change by the state of New Hampshire unconstitutional. So what Marshall is doing in reinforcing the sanctity of private contracts under the Constitution. So that's the kind of stability we're talking about. That's the kind of change that Madison wants to happen as a result of the Constitution of the United States. And John Marshall, when he becomes Chief Justice, begins to fill in many of the blanks that exist in the Constitution of the United States by decisions that focus on the real meaning of clauses like the Commerce Clause, the Contract Clause, the Supreme Law of the Land Clause, the Constitution and laws made under it must be considered by states as well as by the federal government the supreme law of the land. In other words, what that says is when the federal government enters into a treaty or a contract with another nation, states must abide by it. They cannot change it. So in a sense, what Marshall is doing is reinforcing the language of the Constitution as the solution that Madison hoped it would be to creating the kind of stability and predictability that the Constitution brings to the table when it replaces the Articles of Confederation. This is a very, very important, very important issue. So with that, we are at the top of our first hour. We have one more hour to go. And I'd like to use that this next hour to look at Madison's Federalist Number 51, to go back into it some details. So let's take a break for four or five minutes and stretch our legs and, and spend a moment reflecting on some of the things we've already talked about, and then we'll be back together for our second hour. This is the virtual study for the Center of the Constitution. I'm Bill O'Brien. We'll be right back. Thank you. It is uh, five minutes after the hour, and so we've got about 55 minutes left before we uh, back off a few minutes before the top of the hour in order to let Bob Kincaid uh, get ready for, for his broadcast uh, this evening, uh, as we mentioned before the break. And let me, let me begin by doing what I said I would do at the outset, and that is to repeat the phone number, uh, give you a chance to call. Uh, if you, needless to say, if you would like to talk about about Jurgen Herbst, uh, more than more than willing, because I I don't want to I don't want to beat that drum, uh, because it, it it wouldn't be fair to all of you, uh, to to but basically I, I I hope that I was able to to do justice to what to what I who I believe the man that I believe is incredibly worthy of of as much. Uh, goodwill and, and gratitude as, as I'm able to direct his way. The phone number, uh, if you would like to participate live in our program and get on the air, is area code 304-658-3333. That's area code 304-658-3333.
33. And if you'd like to communicate directly with me via email, I promise I will read it before we get back together again tomorrow. Um, my email address is waobrien, all one word, no apostrophe, waobrien906906 at gmail.com. That's waobrien906 at gmail.com. Federalist number 51, considered by most people to be perhaps the, the second most important. And, of course, we'll, we'll go through a number of these Federalist papers in the days and weeks to come because I think they are very significant. The Federalist pay I, I may have mentioned this early on in our time together, but if I didn't, uh, I know I've mentioned it numerous times before in other venues. The Federalist Papers are like Uncle Tom's Cabin. They are so popular, and everybody has heard so much about them, that nobody bothers to read them, other than attorneys. And, and I think that's significant. We'll see that later on. Uh, attorneys, especially corporate attorneys, are very, very familiar with the Federalist Papers because they go to them in order to reinforce particular positions that they want. The most important thing to keep in mind about the Federalist Papers, Uncle Tom's Cabin's like that. Uh, everybody knows what Uncle Tom's Cabin is about, so nobody reads it. And a lot of times, the, 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 the value, the, the strength, the substance of what makes that novel a great one is missed because we tend to accept what other people say as if it were the whole and complete story and there was no there were no other ways to interpret it uh, I that's the whole point here I think we as much as we can we need to return to the sources ourselves we need to recognize that the Federalist Papers all 85 of them were written by John Jay James Madison and Alexander Hamilton in order to promote the ratification of the Constitution in the state of New York. But they are so solid and so substantive that the Federalist Papers are picked up by newspapers throughout the other states. And they're printed widely. But as we've talked in the past, they are written in such a way that the average person even if he is literate and can read the news and reads newspapers, is probably not going to be able to pick up the nuances and the implications and the assumptions that drive the Federalist Papers. And that's kind of what this is about. And somebody made the comment in an email a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to I'm going to reinforce it again. Please don't get the idea that that you know that that I'm somehow able to see through things that other people in. I have spent probably 40 years of my life working on these on these documents, Federalist 10 specifically. Uh, and the point I'm trying to make is this is not something that you could just pick up by one quick reading, and I don't want to imply in what I say. I may sound so glib in my comments that you say to yourself, God, why can't I see that? How come he sees those things? And I, I've spent years looking for these things. And so, uh, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to share that with you. I want you to know that these are difficult. I, 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 more than anybody, I'm willing to admit that these are, are really difficult. So with that, let's, let's kind of look, and hopefully we can get through this uh, today. Federalist number 51 uh, is written by James Madison, and the title in the newspapers is as follows. The structure of the government must furnish the proper checks and balances between the different departments. So that kind of tells you what the theme of Federalist Number 51 is. The structure of the government must furnish the proper checks and balances between the different departments. So what Federalist Number 51 is going to do is not talk about the power of the new federal government under the Constitution as a whole but rather is going to get into the structure and talk, talk about the relationship between the different departments, the different parts, the different branches of government. Madison is taking us in Federalist Number 51 into the forest, and he's going to draw our attention to the trees of the forest 
And I believe, it is my sense, that his goal in all of this is not only to understand how the trees relate to each other, but in the process to lose the perspective that these trees are part of something bigger, a forest. Okay, let's, let's begin to look at Federalist number 51. Madison opens with a question. And he said, to what expedient then shall we finally resort for maintaining in practice the necessary partition of power among the several departments as laid down in the Constitution? In other words, what is our solution? What is expedient? What are we looking for in order to maintain the necessary partition of power among the several departments as specified in the Constitution? And that, it seems to me, is, is, the, you know, is the key to to Ma to Madison's to Madison's question he is taking us into the constitution itself his answer the only answer that can be given is that as all these exterior provisions are found to be inadequate the defect must be supplied by so contriving the interior structure of the government as that its several constituent parts may by their mutual relations, be the means of keeping each other in their proper places. Listen to that sentence. Tell me how many modifying clauses and subclauses there are, you English majors out there. The only answer that can be given is, notice, not the only answer that I can give, the only answer that can be given, past tense, passive voice, is that as all these exterior provisions are found to be inadequate, we can't maintain the practice of the petition of power among the several grants by anything external. Therefore, the only solution, the defect must be supplied by so contriving the interior structure of the government as that its several constituent parts may, by their mutual relations, be the means of keeping each other in their proper places. By so structuring the government internally, that the power of one department runs directly up against the power of another department and the result is to keep each of them in their proper places or to put it in terms that we had a little while ago when an irresistible force such as you meets an immovable object like me you can bet just as sure as you live something's got to give something's got to give something's got to give Madison is banking on the fact that nothing will give and that the sum total of pitting department against department, agency against agency, branch against branch, the result will be preservation of the status quo, stability. It will be the denial of the opportunity to produce change. Without then he goes through and, and says, without presuming to undertake full development of this important idea, I'll hazard a few general observations which may perhaps place it in a clearer light and enable us to form a more correct judgment of the principles and the structure of the government planned by the convention. In other words, he's going to make a few observations about the sentence that he just left us with, which is, Fixing the defect by so contriving the interior structure of government as to pit one department against the other and thereby keep each other in their proper places. And this is, this is one of his observations. In order to lay a due foundation for that separate and distinct exercise of the different powers of government, which to a certain extent is admitted on all hands to be essential to the preservation of liberty, in other words, each department must be able to function because the sum total of all of them functioning is essential to the preservation of liberty, of individual freedom. It is evident that each department should have a will of its own 
and consequently should be so constituted that the members of each should have as little agency as possible in the appointment of the members of the other. In order that each department can function, and in order that no department has its operation interfered with by another department, the first consideration is that each agency, each department, should be appointed by di in different ways so that there's nothing in common about the appointment process in any department. The appointment of the members of one department is a totally separate operation from the appointment of members in the other department. That's his first principle. And he says, were this, if this principle were rigorously adhered to, if we could do it, it would require that all appointments for the Supreme Executive, the President, Legislative, Congress, and Judiciary, magistra Judicial magis Magistries, should be drawn from the same fountain of authority of the people. In other words, if we had our way, it would seem like the best way is to have the people appoint all of these, though channels, through channels having no communication whatsoever with one another. In other words, the ideal would seem to be that the people make all the appointments to the different branches separate from each other. But he says, you can't do that. Some difficulties, he said, uh, and some additional expense would attend if we tried to do it that way, would, would attend to the execution of it. We can't do it that way because, he said, some deviations, therefore, from the principle must be, there are certain contingencies which we got to deal with. For example, he says, in the Constitution of the Judiciary Department in particular, it might be inexpedient to insist rigorously on the principle of the people choosing the judges. First, because peculiar qualifications being essential in the members, the primary consideration ought to be to select the mode of choice which best secures these qualifications. And secondly, because the permanent tenure, lifelong appointment, by which the appointments are held in that department must soon destroy all sense of dependence on the authority con conferring them. In other words, it would seem on the surface that the ideal would be to have the people make all the appointments to the different branches of government. But the fact of the matter is you can't do that because there are certain contingencies and certain requirements that the people wouldn't be up to, to fulfilling. For example, his example is the, ju is the Supreme Court, the judiciary branch. You need to appoint people with special training as judges. And the idea of making them lifetime appointments, once you appoint a judge, it's an appointment for life barring impeachment. Once you do that, then by definition, the appointment tends to become more and more separate from those who appointed him. So it wouldn't be good to keep the people there because in order for the judges to operate, in order for the judges to judge independently, they would have to sever the connection from the people who... So the judge, the judicial branch of government, Madison is saying, is the best example as to why you can't have the people make all these appointments, why the different branches of government are appointed by different people. Here's another observation he makes. It is equally evident, he says, that the members of each department should be as little dependent as possible on those of the others for the emoluments, the, the benefits, the pay, annexed to their offices. In other words, another principle that we need to adhere to is that the members of each department should be as little dependent as possible on the other departments. They ought to be able to hold their position, make the decisions, do their job and receive their pay independent of what anybody in any of the other departments want. He says, were the executive magistrate or the judges not independent of the legislature in this particular, their independence in every other would be merely nominal. Notice, the branch of government he's most concerned with is the legislative branch. That's the branch of government that has been creating the problems during the Confederation period because the legislatures within each state republic are supreme. The governors are weak and the judicial decisions are made within the structure itself. So the legislature is the branch that Madison is most worried about. So his example is 
if the executive or the judges were not dependent of the legislature, then their independence on paper would be just that. They would be independent on paper, but the fact of the matter is it would be a joke because the legislature would control everything. Now he gets to one of the key paragraphs in the document. And after having been through Federalist Number Ten, this ought to be something that we can that we can understand fairly fairly easily. But the great security, he said, against a gradual concentration of the several powers in the same department, and again, what he's worried about more than anything is the legislature. The best pr protection, the great security, against the gradual concentration of power within the same department, consists in giving to those who administer each department the necessary constitutional means and personal motives to resist encroachment of the others. Not only should each department be independent, but there ought to be built-in incentives and built-in protections in order to preserve the independence of that particular branch of government. The provision for defense must, in this, as in all ca other cases, be made commensurate to the danger of the attack. And then he has one of the most famous lines in this particular Federalist paper. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Think about this. Every branch of government, each department, ought to have its ambition rewarded but its ambition ought not to depend on any other branch. It ought to be independently realized. And so this is what you do. You check ambition with ambition. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. The interest of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. It may be a reflection on human nature, he says that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government. In other words, what he's saying, after he says ambition must be made to counteract ambition, the interest of every man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. And then he makes an observation. And he said, this might be a reflection on human nature. This might say to you, this seems awful negative. This seems a terrible way to talk about human nature, that such devices, would ha we would have to resort to such devices in order to control the abuses of government. In other words, he's saying, it's a shame we have to do this, but, and this again, but what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. So Madison is saying is, as bad as this sounds, as negative of a reflection on human nature as this sounds, the fact of the matter is, government itself is the most obvious testimony to human nature that we have. If men were really angels, we wouldn't need government at all. If angels were governing men, we wouldn't need a checks and balances system. We wouldn't need to separate powers. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, Madison says, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. A dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. Madison says in setting up a government, we must pay attention to two things. We must create a government that can administer, control the governed. That's the first thing. But in the next place, we must set up a system which can control itself. 
Making government dependent on the people is a primary control, but obviously it's not enough, Madison is saying. We need to make additional auxiliary precautions. The policy of supplying by opposite and rival interests the defect of better motives might be traced through the whole system of human affairs, private as well as public. This policy of supplying by opposite and rival interest, by pitting interest against interest, by pitting department against department, by pitting, by pitting branch against branch, the defect of better motives this can be traced through the whole system of human affairs, public as well as private. We see it particularly displayed in all the subordinate distributions of power, where the constant aim is to divide and arrange the several offices in such a manner as that each may be a check on the other, that the private interest of every individual may be sentinel over the public rights. These inventions of prudence cannot be less requisite in the distribution of the supreme powers of the state. Madison is saying throughout our lives, public and private growth, we have all seen the benefits to be gained by pinning one interest against another in order to prevent the takeover by one group, uh, you know, the takeover of, of other groups by one group who becomes particularly strong. Or groups that will ally together, that will join together for mutual benefit and take advantage of the third. Madison later on in this document, in case we don't get to it, Madison's going to say later on, what happens, for example, if two branches of government get together in order to overwhelm the third? How do we prevent that? And Madison's argument is we have to so structure the system that that can happen. What we have to do is create a government which is built upon the model of an irresistible force such as you, meeting an immovable object like me. With the result, Madison says, not that something's got to give, but that something won't. That the result will be hostility to change, the inability to change. This system can be changed only slowly, only with extreme difficulty. Now, a lot of people are going to say, but there's an amendment process in there. You can amend the Constitution. But how do you do it? Look at the system. And we will get to this when we start looking at various sections of the Constitution. Look at the system of amendment, how difficult it is. Why do you think there are so few amendments to the Constitution of the United States over, over 240 years? The answer is because it's so difficult to get an amendment approved. You've got to get it approved by two-thirds of the states, and then it's got to be ratified by three-quarters, by the people in three-quarters of the states. Think about how difficult that is. Think about how many years the Equal Rights Amendment was out there and how difficult it was to get that through the system. So Madison is saying, if men were angels, we wouldn't need a government at all. But since man isn't, we've got to create the kind of government that can control man's nature. Man is not, men are not angels. If angels were governing men, we wouldn't worry about external checks, internal checks, or anything else. Madison goes on, this policy of supplying by opposite and rival interests, the defect of better motives, might be traced through the whole system of human affairs. We talked about that. He said, we see it particularly displayed in all the subordinate distributions of power where the constant aim is to divide and arrange the several offices in such a manner that one may be used to check the other. So what he's saying is we're all used to this if we'll think about it. We all know this works. These inventions of prudence, these strategies for common sense, he said, cannot be less requisite in the distribution of the supreme powers of the state. Why would we think that government itself shouldn't be structured the same way that we do things in our private lives? 
But he said it's not possible to give to each department an equal power of self-defense. How do we create balance? You can't structure it in such a way that each of the branches is equally powerful to each of the other branches. Of course, what he's got in the back of his mind here is the legislative branch. He is paranoid because of the Confederation experience. It's the legislative branch that brings us to this in the first place. It's not the power of the president that worries him. It's not the power of the judiciary that worries him. It's the majority faction in the legislature that worries him. That's what drove Federalist Number 10. That's what drives his attention right now. It is not possible, he says, to give to each department an equal power of self-defense. In Republican government, now he's going to say what, he, what, he, what I suggested he only believes. In Republican government, the legislative authority necessarily dominates. In Republican government, it's the legislative branch that is the danger. It, it predominates. The remedy for this inconveniency is to divide the legislature in two, into different branches, thus a Senate and a House of Representatives. So what you do is not only do you separate government into different branches, but then you take the most dangerous branch of all, the legislative branch, and you divide it in half into a legislature and a House of Representatives. By dividing the legislature into different branches, you render them by different modes of election. And at the time the Constitution, up until the 20th century, members of the Senate were chosen by state legislatures. The two senators from each state were chosen by state legislatures. And the, uh, the representatives in the House of Representatives, the congressmen, were elected by the people in each state. That's where the enlarged sphere that Federalist Number 10 talks about applies. So the way, you, the way you protect yourself is by dividing the legislature into different branches and render the, each branch by different modes of election and different principles of action as little connected with each other as the nature of their common, common functions and their common dependence on the society will admit. In other words, you, cr you divide the legislature in such a way that the legislature will come together not automatically but with difficulty. That's why it's so hard to get laws passed, because you've got to get both branches of the legislature to agree. Then you've got to get the president to sign it. Then you've got to get the Supreme Court to, ex to, uh, to, to give in to the fact that it's constitutional. So you have so many built-in checks and balances. He said, it may even be necessary to guard against dangerous encroachments by still further precautions, he says. As the weight of the legislative authority requires that it should be thus divided, the weakness of the executive may require, on the other hand, that it should be fortified. In other words, because of the potential threat of the legislature, dividing it into two separate parts may not be enough. He said it may be necessary to increase the power of the executive, to increase the power of the president even more than it already is. And then he talks about an absolute negative. The right of the president to veto on the legislature appears at first view to be the natural defense with which the executive magistrate should be on. We ought to give the president an absolute veto over the laws that come out of Congress. We ought to give the president the right to not sign specific pieces of legislation. The president ought to have the power to veto what the legislature passes. But, he says, perhaps it would be neither altogether safe nor alone sufficient. On ordinary occasions, it might not be ex exerted with the requisite firmness. And on extraordinary occasions, it might be abused. In other words, if we give the president this kind of power, an absolute veto, then we're going to be dealing with humanity, with, with human personality here. We might have a president that, that won't enforce it, that's not firm enough, or we might have a president that's inclined to abuse that power. So the solution there might be worse than the, than the you know, the solution might be worse than the disease itself. 
May not this defect be an absolute negative? Uh, this defect of an absolute negative be supplied by some qualified connection between the weaker department and the weaker branch of the stronger department. No, how it, notice how he writes this and how difficult it is to understand. May not this defect, the fact that it's too dependent on the personality of the president, it could be not enforced on the one hand or abused on the other. The way to deal with this, he says, is to, is to create some sort of qualified connection between this weaker department, which is the executive, and the weaker branch of the stronger department, which is the Senate. In other words, the stronger department is the legislature, so the weaker branch of the stronger department is the Senate, and the weaker branch is the president. So what he says is maybe by creating some sort of qualified connection between the office of the president and the Senate, we can offset the danger of the lower house, the danger of the people's branch. And then he's, and this is the way he says it, which I think is incredibly wordy. This is what makes him so difficult to understand. Let me read the whole sentence. May not this defect of an absolute negative be supplied by such some qualified connection between this weaker department and the weaker branch of the stronger department? by which the latter may be led to support the constitutional rights of the former without being too much detached from the rights of its own department. Think about that. How, how could you make sense? Think about the level at which our people read generally, our students, our young people, how well they read. How could they possibly figure out what that sentence means when he's talking about the weaker branch, the stronger branch, the weaker branch of the, the 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 weaker branch and the weaker branch of the stronger branch, and then he's talking about the latter and the former, without being too much detached from the rights of its own department. Most readers would give up on that and said, "I can't even understand what that means." What he's talking about is the value of the United States Senate as a check on the House of Representatives. And now he's going to go back and attack the Confederation. He said, if the principles on which these observations were founded are just, as I persuade myself they are, and they be applied as the criterion to the several state constitutions and to the federal constitution, it will be found that if the latter does not perfectly correspond with them, the former are infinitely less able to bear such a test. Translated. What Madison is saying is if we take these principles and we apply them to the new federal government under the Constitution and to the state governments, what we find is while the federal government might not be perfectly consistent with these principles, the state governments are infinitely less able to bear that kind of a test. So what, what he's pointing out is as bad as the Constitution, as hard as it will be to get the Constitution to live within these, within, within these parameters, within these controls, or within these checks, it's obvious that we can't get the states to do it. Therefore, the power of the federal government must be conceived. And then he says, there are, moreover, two considerations particularly applicable to the federal system, which place this system in an interesting point of view. First, in a single republic, all the power surrendered by the people is submitted to the administration of a single government. Now, this is the federal system, the division between the federal government and the state governments. First, he says, in a single republic, which is what we had under the Articles of Confederation, all the power surrendered by the people is submitted to the administration of a single government, the state legislature and the usurpations are guarded against by a division of the government into distinct and separate departments. In this compound republic of America, the power surrendered Sorry for the interruption, but one of my, my other phone rang. <laughs> and uh, I had to make sure that it wasn't something important. So what Madison is talking about is 
that in a single republic, which is what we have in the states, all the power that the people surrender to government goes to one single government. And the kind of usurpations that we're guarding against in, by the division of the government that we've been talking about won't work. In the compound Republic of America, under the Constitution, he's saying, the power surrendered by the people is first divided between two distinct governments, the federal government and the state governments. And then the portion allotted to each is subdivided, subdivided again among distinct and separate departments. We have what he, he says, hence a double security arises to the rights of the people. What Madison is suggesting, what Madison says, not just suggesting, is that the rights of the people, people's freedom, is protected primarily because we have so structured government that it can't interfere with people's individual freedom. We have created so many internal checks and balances, so many counters. We have pitted one group against the other. We've pitted state governments against federal government. We pitted the Senate against the House of Representatives. We pitted the presidency against the courts, the courts against the presidency, the presidency against Congress, Congress against the courts, etc. There are so many internal checks and balances that the rights of the people are protected, Madison said. In other words, the rights of the people are protected because we have created a government which is going to find it very difficult to govern. That means that the positive legislation that government passed under the Confederation to come to the aid of people and in the process violate contracts, vi violate private contracts, violate tax laws, violate the rights of the minorities, all the things that Madison def defined as vices of the political system of the United States will no longer be possible because we have so structured government that it can no longer do those things. So what we have done is we have guaranteed people's liberty by creating a political structure which, can't, which they cannot influence, which will not budge. The result, as Madison said in Federalist Number 10, is by doing this, we will therefore preserve good government. That's what Alexander Hamilton said on the floor of the, of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. By creating a government which cannot respond to the interests of the majority, we are able to preserve a government which will be able to respond to the interests of the minority. Madison doesn't get into that here. The result is that the priorities of the creditor class, the landowners, the upper class, the elite, the governing class, the few, whatever you wanted to call it, will be preserved because government will be so structured that while the people believe they control it, the, factor, the, the fact is they will be unable to move it. It is almost like pouring concrete over the, politicals, over the federal system. That's how difficult it's going to be to get anything through this system. And if you think about it, we're 15 minutes, uh, we're actually about 10 minutes from the end of our program today, so it's time that we begin to pull some of these things together. If you think about it in, from our own experience, we have seen a government that did not falter even when the President of the United States in Watergate was forced to resign. The Vice President, Spiro Agnew, went to jail. We saw a political system that is so stable that it is immune to who sits in the, in the White House. We are seeing today in Washington a situation where a minority, through the idea of the filibuster, a minority is able to stymie and bring government to a halt. So as difficult it is, as it is to get government to move, to do anything, that's the system that Madison created. We have also created additional checks like the filibuster system, which allows the, a, mono, a, major, excuse me, a minority of senators to keep government from passing anything. 
In other words, we have basically stymied government's ability to govern. We have made the system so stable and so immune to popular pressure. We saw it last week with the defeat of the background checks on the gun legislation co-sponsored by Senator Toomey of Pennsylvania and Senator Manchin from right here in West Virginia. Ninety percent of the people wanted that change. Yet the minority in the United States Senate saw fit not to respond to that. So are we a government that is susceptible to majority rule? Kind of. But the fact of the matter is we have a situation now where a minority feels comfortable in not subscribing to the will of the majority, even though that majority constitutes about 90% if we believe the polls. And, of course, I've seen a lot of people who are responding to this, and they will say, as, as I think some of us realize, that the 90% don't feel nearly as passionate about the particular legislation on the table, the background checks, as do the minority who want to block that change. So the, the, the degree of commitment and passion is part of it. The people who want to preserve the right to own weapons without any kind of government interference or regulation at all, their passion is much stronger and much more volatile and much more explosive than are the 90% who answer surveys that they would like to see some sort of background legislation passed. And all of this in spite of the Newtown situation and, and all the, you know, the Sandy Hook situation and all the rest of it. So that's Madison's first observation, that, that what, we, what we have done is we have built in an additional check by our federal system which puts some power on the state level and some power on the federal level. We have so divided and pitted group against group, department against department, agency against agency, branch against branch, that we have literally created the irresistible force such as you trying to move an immovable object like me. And rather than something got to give, something got to give, Madison is pretty certain that this system is going to keep anything from giving at all. And the result is going to be preservation of minority rule against the threat of majority faction in our political system. And then he says, and I, I wrote in my, my notes here, I wrote a wow besides this. Let me read this paragraph. This is Madison's final point because the document pretty much, you know, pretty much ends here. His second observation, it is of great importance in a republic, he says, not only to guard the society against the oppression of its rulers, but to guard one part of the society against the injustice of the other part. So now he is basically sub rationalizing or justifying the system put together in the Constitution. Not only do we have to protect people from rulers, we've got to protect one part of society from the injustices of the other part. Different interests, now he's back to fashion. Uh, to factions. Different interests necessarily exist in different classes of citizens. If a majority be, be united by a common interest, Madison said, the rights of the majority will be, in, the rights of the minority will be insecure. If the majority is united by a common interest, the minority is in trouble. There are two ways of providing against this evil. This is a repeat of what he said in Federalist Number 10. There are but two methods of providing against this evil. One, by creating a will in the community independent of the majority, that is, of the society itself. The other, by comprehending in the society so many separate descriptions of citizens as will render an unjust combination or a, of a majority of the whole very improbable, if not impracticable. In other words, he's repeating what he said in Federalist Number 10. By enlarging the sphere, you make it less likely that there will even be a majority faction. But if there is, they will be rendered by their location. In other words, they will be rendered by the very size of the constituency, so spread out that they won't even know that they are part of a majority. 
and until the majority is able to organize, the minority continues to make the rules. And that's, that's basically what he's talking about. He said it's the same, he uses as an example, religious freedom. Madison was the co-author, along with Jefferson, of the Bill for Religious Freedom in Virginia that passed the Virginia legislature in 1786 under the Confederation. So the idea of religious freedom was passed in 1786 in Virginia. And Madison's process, the process was the same. By having so many different religious sects, groups, denominations within the state, you make it unlikely that one will be able to predominate over the other. The result is, if you have a lot of political groups, each of them trying to, to get their best to get their own best advantage the result will be religious freedom religious toleration you have made it impossible by bringing in so many different religious group, religious groups that one religion will be able to dominate therefore you have a separation of church and state when you have one religion that is able to dominate it will be able to to get influence over the state. The state will be able to pass laws requiring citizens' tax money to go to the support of a particular religion. And Madison argued in 1786 in his bill in Virginia, that's a violation of religious freedom. So the only way to protect religious freedom is to have so many different religious groups that no one group is able to control government, which means no, that no one group is able to use government to its own advantage. And that's the basis for the, for the idea of separation of church and state in our society. It's the only way to preserve religious freedom is to make sure that no one religion can control government, can control the state. Or to put it another way, you make it impossible for the state to favor one religious group over another re religious group. You create so many and pit one against the other that none of the, neither, no one is able to predominate over the other. And so Madison's principle of religious freedom is pretty much laid out in the mid-80s the same way as he does his factions under the Constitution. And so I would suggest that in Federalist Number 51, Madison has reinforced and clarified even more for those who can read it ways that the new federal constitution is going to make impossible the kind of vices that predominated during the confederation period. I think these two federalist papers together do so much to explain the way that the federal system is designed to work and the reasons for it. And I think it is particularly important. One of the things that we've not done is yet, and I think it's time we do, and this is, if you'll bear with me, this will be kind of my role as as historian. I, I've done a lot of reading about this period, and I know a lot about it. There may be people out there who are saying, all of this is well and good, but how do we get to this point? What what happened? What, what, is the, well, what is the independence movement about? What is this business about the Declaration of Independence uh, and the problems of the Confederation uh, leading to the Constitution? In other words, I guess what is necessary is that we begin to look a little bit at the whole issue of what prompted, what promoted the independence movement in the first place. We like to believe that American independence was caused by Great Britain that Britain so infringed on the rights of, co of the American colonists that the, colony, the colonists had no alternative except to overthrow the British government and declare their independence. I would suggest to you that most of us believe that. And not only do we believe it because that's what we've been taught in school, but the reason we've been taught that in school is because that's what Jefferson told us in the Declaration of Independence. He told us in the Declaration that the only way our rights can be preserved is if we have a government whose power is limited. 
and that if government tries to overstep the limits, if government tries to do more than people are willing to give it the power to do, the people have not just the right, they have the duty to overthrow that government and create a new one which will subscribe to the limitations on power that the people impose upon it. So what we need to do, it seems to me, in our, pro in our next program, is to begin to look at the whole idea of the, of the Declaration, what causes some people to support independence and some people to oppose it. What's the difference? And how do we get into the Confederation period? And what exactly is the structure of the Confederation period that leads to the kind of vices that Madison has been pointing to as, as justifying the need for a revision which is the Constitution of the United States. I guess what I'm saying is, let's back up a little bit and let's kind of begin to do a little bit of discussion about the overview of the period itself. And I, I feel comfortable that I can help us do that. So with that, we are at 57 minutes after the hour. We've got about three minutes left before the top of the hour. Bob Kincaid will take over. So let me, let me first of all, thank you for being with us today. Let me also suggest that I'm so glad that we didn't we had a few glitches, but we didn't have any technical glitches. So I think I think we've got all the gremlins out of the system and we're gonna be good to go from here on in. And I'm I'm kind of excited about that. And again, let me encourage you to think about what we talked about today. And if you have questions, by all means, if you want to send them to me independently in an email, by all means it's WA O'Brien nine oh six at gmail.com. But if you'd like to call tomorrow and let's discuss them, raise your questions, or if I can clarify, I'm not sure I can handle all your questions. I can try. But I would suggest that you keep in mind that if you have a question, chances are there are a lot of other people out there that have the same question. And the whole purpose of this is to engage in dialogue, not subject ourselves to monologue. With that, let me bid you uh, a, a great evening. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Let me thank you for being with us, and please be safe because we want you back with us. This is Bill O'Brien, Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution. We'll be back together again tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>